The steam engine is not just a part of the story of uh, navigation and land transportation. It's in our language. Uh, it's, it's part of us, you know, getting your steam up or keeping ahead of steam. It transformed history when the steam engine was introduced. And in many ways, it was a almost ideal form of generating power. The steam engine is a beautiful idea. And if you've ever ridden on a, on a steam boat, it's a beautiful, smooth ride. You say American Steamboat to the average person they think of Mississippi mostly because of Mark Twain's writings. But steamers like the Nopska really are the more typical American steamer. Steamboats have been compared to swans in that they are very quiet. They move through. If you're not looking at the land, you often can't tell you're moving. So it's like maybe riding on an iceberg. The thing is there's no vibration from a steam engine uh, because there's no explosions within the cylinders. It's just a steady pulse of steam. So you get this very tranquil feeling when you're on board. Probably the single characteristic you'd recognize most about the Nopska is sitting on the upper deck in the open air. Uh, that being what the ride on the Nopska was really all about. I remember vividly, for example, crossing from Martha's Vineyard to uh, Nantucket one summer to visit a friend on Nantucket, taking our children and just settling back on that beautiful boat and that kind of very soft rhythm of the steam engine and feeling a kind of, of um, relaxation that somehow I don't think comes with other forms of power and transportation. It has now been almost 30 years since the steamship Nopska made regular runs to the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. In a world where getting from point A to point B in the fastest amount of time is the norm, entire generations of people are growing up without knowing the experience of riding steamboats in quiet elegance. In fact, the Nopska is currently the only coastal steamboat that remains in the United States. This is the Nopska of today. A shell of its former self, it sits in dry dock at the Charlestown Navy Yard in Boston directly adjacent to the USS Constitution. In the year 2000, the restoration began with an effort to replace the hull, with the ultimate goal being to have the Nopska completely restored to once again carry passengers to the islands. The condition it was in was pretty ghastly. Uh, the interior had all been stripped. The only thing in it was the main engine. There, there had, had been a report you know, written on the vessel a prior to my arriving in the scene in November of 95, which implied that you know the plating and the hull and the, the keel were all in excellent condition. But unfortunately we couldn't check that at the time because it was in the water and uh, we couldn't get to the keel plate because somebody welded a plate over the top of that section. So by the time we burned that all off we realized the keel was like Swiss cheese. Normally uh, when a ship comes into a uh, dry dock it comes in for we call it a shave and a haircut. They do the uh, they clean off the bottom, paint it, do the sea valves, and put new zincs on, and out it goes again. This ship uh, didn't have any paint on the bottom, but it had a collection of mussels, oysters, and barnacles. We had to clean all that off uh, with shovels and scrapers. And, and uh, when we did all that and then inspected it, there were two areas on the bottom that were about the size of a baseball. that I could put my hand right up inside the ship, so it was that close to sinking before he got in here. We realized that it was going to be extensive work. And as we began to remove the wasted plate, we saw that it would require more and more work than we had originally anticipated. That was determined that we were going to have to replace most of the center vertical keel and a good many of the, of the ribs that come out from the keel. This is a new one for me. I mean, uh, actually doing some, some steel work on a ship. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff on ships, and tank cleaning and repairs for uh, machinery and stuff on ships. But actual fabricating and, and 
doing steel work, this is, this is new. For close to 50 years, the Nobska serviced New Bedford, Cape Cod, and the islands. But to better understand the ship's longevity, one must first look at U.S. maritime history around the turn of the century. If you go back a couple of hundred years in, in this region, uh, which is one of the oldest parts of the country, uh, it isn't land-based uh, in those times. The water is equally important as the land and maybe more important from the standpoint of transportation. It was very, very difficult to travel overland. And so from the very earliest days of settlement, it was the sea to which they turned, not only for fishing and for their livelihood, but also for movement. You moved by the sea along the coast. And nowhere was this more apparent than in the area south of Cape Cod. I'm pretty sure I did read somewhere that the travel on the Vineyard Sound was once as great as travel on the English Channel. That this was a main highway, water highway, up and down uh, the coast. And when you think of all the different kinds of ships carrying lumber and passengers and freight of all kinds, this is historic ground, if you will, though it's needless to say, water. Before automobiles, getting from Woods Hole to New Bedford was not an easy task. You could not drive from one to the other, so if you lived on one of the islands, you took a boat to Woods Hole or you took a boat to New Bedford. Although steam engine technology was in use in the early 1900s, the main function of steamships was to transport passengers to their destination. Passengers like to get to a place on time, on a schedule. Sailing vessels cannot offer you on-time service. You're at the mercy of the wind. So passengers then were willing to pay more to move on steam vessels. So very early on, steam vessels took the cream of the crop. That is, they took the passenger trade. They were side wheel steamers, which had, had areas for freight, but there was no accommodation for automobiles. And they were smaller. And uh, they had open four decks, which is tough in Nantucket Sound in the winter. And a lot of those old side wheelers were all wooden. The, the uh, Uncatina was the first vessel that had a metal hull. And uh, she was a side wheeler as well. She was the last of the side wheelers. The Sankety of 1911 was also running. And she was a propeller boat, the first propeller boat built for the line. But she was never popular with the people because she was quite narrow of beam and rolled a lot. Very uncomfortable for the passengers. The 1920s brought a dramatic change in transportation to the islands. In a period of just six years, four new steamships were built to better accommodate automobiles. The Islander, the Nobska, the New Bedford, and the Nauchon. The four boats were referred to as the White Fleet. It's important to realize that these four boats were really built for cars. Uh, the 1920s, the automobile had come of age in America, and the, uh, these four vessels were actually built with the particular idea of dealing with uh, more accommodation for automobiles. And that's the chief reason why they built four boats in such a short time, was that the old boats could carry very few cars. The Sanctity could only carry a couple, and the, uh, the Uncatina, for instance, carried like six out on, uh, way out on the bow whereas these boats could carry 25 and more automobiles. When people now went on vacation, they took their automobiles with them. The mobility that they had at home was a mobility they wanted to continue to enjoy on vacation. The automobile became almost like a piece of luggage. I want to take it with me. And people insisted on having that personal means of transportation at their disposal. And so it was necessary then to build vessels that could, in fact, accommodate to bring on board automobiles. The first of the White Fleet, the Islander of 1923, was um, very successful. She was designed with a broader uh, main deck, though her hull was still reasonably narrow. And she had a lot of the characteristics of the side wheel steamers, and as a result was more stable and much more popular with the, with the passengers from both islands. With the success of the Islander, the steamship company commissioned Bath Iron Works to build a second vessel. It was called Nobska, after the familiar point of land off of Woods Hole. The word Nobska itself comes from a variation of the name of a Mashpee Indian chief, but there was barely any time to get used to it, 
for after only three years, the vessel received a new name. When the New Bedford came out in 1928, the company apparently got the bright idea that since they were the New Bedford Mathis Vineyard Nantucket Steamship Company, that they should uh, name the boats accordingly. So the uh, island became the Mathis Vineyard and the Nobsco became Nantucket. And uh, then of course with the new boat, New Bedford, they had the main ports of the line all covered. The 1930s saw the now named Nantucket endure some of its greatest challenges. Its first, coming after an early morning departure from Edgartown, the Nantucket in a thick fog ran aground on Sturgeon Flats. It took six days to free the ship from the sand. Luckily, the ship suffered no damage. In 1932, the fog was the culprit again, as the Nantucket and the Martha's Vineyard collided. The Martha's Vineyard was headed toward Nantucket, out in the middle of the sound, and the Nantucket was coming in from the outer island. And the two of them came along, and they knew they were close together. They were barely moving ahead at very, very slow speed. They could hear each other's whistles. In fact, they were so close they could hear the people on the other boat talking. Um, but uh, regardless of what happened, they managed to collide with each other. The Nobska's bow went into the forward staterooms on the port side of the Mathis Vineyard, uh, wrecked one of the lifeboats, tore a fair gash, but on the Mathis Vineyard, the uh, damage was all above the guardrail. It was in one of those days on Nantucket Sound where the sky is blue, but there's fog on the water and both ships were able to manage to get to port. No, but no lives were lost. But it was one of those days which today would never happen because you have radar. The Nantucket sustained enough damage that it had to go to Boston for extensive repairs. Remember, when the Navska came out in 1925, when she left the dock, there was no communication, no GPS, no radio, telephone. That was an island moving. In the old days, we didn't have radar. Uh, so we had to use dead reckoning and people identified the ship, both in the fog and elsewhere, by the sound of its whistle. The whistle is probably the Nobska's most identifiable and most loved feature. Chime whistles, like the Nobska's, actually have three different notes. It's a cylinder, which is divided into th three chambers, and each one blows with a different tone. It's different than an air whistle that you hear because the steam continues to blow even after you pull the handle, whereas the air just drops, the pressure drops off. As opposed to a horn, like on a diesel, the whistles are, are multi-directional. The sound goes in all directions, so you get echoes you know, off of hills or other vessels or barns or whatever. And to that was added the captain's own particular touch because each captain would pull the whistle cord and could actually, by pulling it in certain ways, could actually feather the whistle and get a, a, a low sound and a high sound and a full sound. Some captain hung on to the whistle a little longer than the rest of us. You know. I used to have a lot of people that that lived in Nantucket, they used to come up just to blow the whistle. I mean, the young kids and all. When they got inside the jetty, coming into Nantucket, they would give three long blasts. When they got to Brant Point, give one blast and two short ones. And that let the town people know the boat was coming. If you wanted to get down to meet someone, you had ample time after you heard the three blasts to get from town down to the dock. All the incidents of the early 30s led to many advances in communications for the steamships. Ship-to-shore radios were installed as the steamship company could no longer afford to put its passengers in danger. But all the communications in the world could not help ships in a good winter freeze. Essentially what happens is you get a, a real Montreal clipper and the, the northwest cold winds for about a week to ten days with zero temperatures and it blows the ice into the arm of Nantucket and it just fills up that space and ultimately it can fill up the whole sound. I can remember the sound freezing up during one winter where you could stand up on the cliffs and look to the north and see nothing but ice. They seemed to come in groups. Uh, they had a period in the 30s that they had several of them. 
uh, in pretty close together years. Brown Nantucket. The hardest thing was, I think, for a lot of people, if we missed a boat for two or three days, nobody knew a great deal about what was going on on the mainland because the newspapers came over on the boat. Amazingly, the Nantucket still made it through. She had a very, very thin fore section, so she was great going through ice. She didn't ride up on the ice, she split it. For the remainder of the 1930s, the effects of the Depression were felt in the region, and the number of runs to the islands were far less frequent. They didn't need all the ships on the run from New Bedford to the islands, and so the Nobscot ran out of Providence. Uh, she'd make, I guess it was a round trip a day, several days a week, and then she'd run moonlight sails down the bay to Newport. There was a time prior to World War II, Fourth of July, they used to dress her up in lights and she'd take an evening sail out of Nantucket and anybody and everybody that wanted to follow along with their boats all lighted up, have an evening parade. The 1940s and World War II saw the end of the White Fleet as both the New Bedford and the Nauchon were called into service as transports and hospital ships. They would never return to their regular runs. For a while during the war, the boats to the islands consisted of only the Martha's Vineyard and the Nantucket, both now painted gray. In 1949, the state took control of the steamship line and formed the Steamship Authority. One of its first moves was to send the Nantucket to Boston for an extensive rebuild. They needed even more space for automobiles, so they moved several of the passenger amenities, like the lunch counter and so forth, up onto the second deck, the salon deck which gave them room for, I think, 10 more automobiles. They took out the wooden frame windows, which were in all the staterooms, put in steel and bronze. Uh, she really had a major rehab. And they replaced a lot of plates and frames on her, so that that's why she lasted longer, you know. The other boats, they didn't put that into it. They just kept it as original. So uh, she had a lot of new steel in her. Although the rebuild of 1950 would add many more years of life to the ship, the restoration that is taking place today is far more extensive. With significant greater requirements in shipbuilding, the rebuilding of the Nobska's hull continues, with constant testing done to every piece of metal. American Bureau of Shipping visits us on a regular basis and inspect plating, uh, design, weld, uh, structure, frames, etc and uh, and approves it. They came and, and actually tested the uh, thickness of, the, of the, the shell plating. And wherever it was thick enough, above that line, it was thick enough that way they were able to save it. But down below here, it was too thin, so it needs to be replaced. In fact, it was clear that much of the hull was in need of replacement. All the way up to this uh, a lower deck stringer will be replaced, which is a longitudinal member. Uh, everything from that towards the, the box keel will be replaced. And that section of the keel right there is the motor foundation, and that, that section of the keel will be saved. That was in good enough shape. Uh, being underneath the engine and having oil on it throughout its life, there wasn't uh, as much uh, deterioration. So the new keel goes all the way from the, from the stem and the bow, and it will, it will go all the way to the engine room, and then we're going to use the existing engine foundation, which incorporates the keel, so we'll have an original piece of the keel there. Keeping a part of the original Nobska keel is important for the ship to remain the Nobska. A completely new keel would technically make it a new ship. The keel plate in this vessel uh, was not in great shape, but we saved probably about 30% of it. Another 70% was taken out completely and replaced. Most of the ribs of the ship were also in need of replacing. Well, the old ribs are going to stay where they are. We'll put the new shell plating on tack it in place. That way we have the shape of the ship. And then we'll go inside and remove a couple ribs at a time and replace them, and then work our way back at. I've lived here now year-round for nearly 30 years and I first came over in 1951 uh, 
on the on the Islander, which is still running. And if I was lucky, I got to ride the Nobska. The Nobska was the one I loved. The Nobska, it seemed to me, looked like a steamboat out of luck. And uh, you got on board that that boat, that ship, and you could. It didn't matter that you're just sailing across uh, 45 minutes uh, to uh, Vineyard Abe. You could be you could be on your way to Europe. It had a romance. It had a it had a it had character. Is what it had. The bow was a little higher than the stern. She had the shape to go through the water smoothly. She was powered with steam, which is a very efficient and quiet means of propulsion. The Knobsker and her sister steam vessels were truly a remarkable piece of machinery that could both transport you and entertain you at the same time. Getting there was only part of the fun. It was being on the vessel. It was a full experience. People would wait hours to ride the steamers because of the, the, the quiet and the luxuriating that would happen. Jimmy Cagney was one of the famous vineyard people that insisted he had to take the Nobska, had to have a certain stateroom, and would wait hours to take that boat just for the ambiance. The steamers of the 20s and the Nobska and Martha's Vineyard and New Bedford and the Norshan were kind of symbolic of what people went to the islands for. We had people Love to sail out of here on the morning boat, see the sunrise come up. Go to Woods Hole, spend the day at the laboratory there or the museum, or take the bus or a cab up to Falmouth, take the night boat back, see the beautiful sunset on the way back. People enjoyed taking the time to notice those things. When we first came to Nantucket, I was working in New York City, and I welcomed the five and a half hours that it took us to get from the mainland to Nantucket. It was a pleasant change. I got to know one of the pilots, Joe Pikus, was a good friend of mine. And we could let Joe know when we were coming up. He'd always make one area in one part of the decks available for our group. <laughs> we had some great parties on those steamers, both the Nobska and the Bartos Vineyard. The Nobska and the later Norshawn were the last two vessels where you had deck chairs that you could move around on deck. And, and what people did, they got in coffee clutches, and, and if you had little kids, they would make a circle of chairs, and the kids would be in the center, and it was a whole different way of travel than the way it is now. People rented staterooms, and they weren't for sleeping. They were just quiet little rooms where you could keep your family, keep your luggage. It's a whole different milieu, a whole different way of thinking about water travel. We now have all the old steamer routes reduced to the shortest possible ferry routes, just as it is between Hyannis and Nantucket, Woods Hole and Martha's Vineyard today. And the vessels became designed to carry even more cars and, and be somewhat less hospitable to people, partly because the people spent less time aboard. And the remaining business of it is that we have now none of the steamers left Nobska is the very last of the, of the real coastal steamers the United States had, and that makes her unique. The steam vessels that we're talking about, like the Nobska, were extraordinarily quiet. Uh, the steam-powered machinery moved with a grace and smoothness that we're simply not accustomed to to even to watch the pistons on these vessels moving it was to see grace and they move so quietly so silently the only thing that you might hear up on deck back aft on the port side they had a dynamo generate electricity for them and that was a little more noisy but down below, just a whir, and she kept running and running and running. My first impression when I went uh, down the engine room was the rails on uh, the ladder was so hot, I had to let them go. All them oily smells was down there. It was very distinctive uh, 
Older. Because of the way they lubricate the ship, they didn't use petroleum-based oils, they used vegetable-based oils, so she smelt like french fries. This is the engine of the Nopska today. Upon the ship entering dry dock, the engine was removed and transported to the vocational high school in New Bedford, where students have the unique opportunity to work on a part of history. The New England Steamship Foundation was looking for a home, and so they took over the old building next to the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, which was just a shell, and we hired the Votech kids to do all the work, and we supplied the materials to, re to redo that whole building. And that was really what started it. And then we said, gee, well, maybe they could do the engine. So we talked to Mr. Fry, he was in charge of that department, and said, do you think you're interested in doing that? And they said, absolutely. And uh, it was kind of funny because some of the kids that we had working on it, their actual uh, parents had, had, had you know, sailed for the, the shipping company and they actually sailed on it. Students really enjoy working on it. Uh, it is a historic vessel. It used to sail out of uh, New Bedford. Um, I remember it when I was younger. Uh, but they look forward to working on it. Uh, it's something they really haven't seen the ship, but they, they've got ideas of it. We've showed them pictures of it. When the ship was laid up, subsequent to its career, its operating career, and it became a restaurant for a period of time in Baltimore. It was operated with an electric motor and a gearbox to turn the uh, crank and the cylinders, the pistons in the cylinders, to give the customers in the restaurant the atmosphere, the ambience of a steamship uh, operating, which uh, may or may not have done it any good but it has sat there uh, idle since uh, some now uh, 12, 15 years that it hasn't been running. So what time does to everything is done to this engine. The engine had to be completely disassembled and each part ultrasonically tested. We did inspect the whole thing with Magnaflux the engine and uh, we had the, the actual uh, piston rods, they, they had to be replaced, they were all, had they all full of cracks. So we made new piston rods. But other than that, uh, the rest of the repairs are you know, pr pretty easy to do. It's been a great learning lab for the students down here. They'll very f seldom will they have a chance to see a steam engine like this in their lifetime. And when that vessel is back and it's, it's up and running, I mean, there's going to be a lot, a lot of pride there for the whole school. We're faced right now with a very serious problem. We are, alas, shamefully, raising a generation of young Americans who are, by and large, historically illiterate. And that's not their faults, that's our faults. And we not, we, it isn't just that we have to revise the ways we're teaching history, but we have to bring a, 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 an historical sense to everything we do. And surely one of the ways to appeal to youngsters today is to talk about the adventures, the excitement, the importance of our history on the high seas. It's perfectly natural. Everyone loves a good sea story. In 1956, a new ship was built, and because its primary route would be to Nantucket, it was christened Nantucket, with the old Nantucket returning to its original name, Nobscot. She was Nantucket a few more years than Nobsker in her total life on the island line. But when she got her original name back, it was, uh, it was really good because as, mu as nice as it is to have the boats named for the islands, when there's been as many of them named for it as it is, uh, Nobsker's the only steamer Nobsker that was ever built for the service. The start of the 60s saw some of the worst weather the Nobsker would endure. About 1960, the late 50s and early 60s, we had about three freeze-ups. And that was the Nobsk's greatest hour because in 61, after the uh, big new Nantucket had been unable to get through, the Nobsk actually managed to get out there and make it through the ice to Nantucket. And they'd been a few days without a boat, so they claimed that she was loaded with freight from stem to stern and even had freight carried up onto the saloon deck in order to uh, resupply the island with the, with the necessities of life. The mail on that boat when she got here, you, you can't imagine, probably filled four or five trailer trucks. 
Despite its continuing popularity throughout the 1960s, eventually the advances in transportation would catch up to the last of the White Fleet. Getting your car over to the islands as fast as possible became the goal, and double-ended loaders' diesel power became the ship of choice. Side loading is much less efficient than double-ended ferry boats that load on each end because you've got to jockey the cars around inside and back them down the boat so that they can come out. When they come out, they come out forward. The gangplanks were narrow. You knew people that didn't want to drive their cars over that gangplank, so the crew would do it. It was an art to load the boat and get everybody on. Some bosuns could load the boat and get two or three extra cars on. Some could load the boat and just about get the reserve number on. And a lot of these automobiles in those days, of course, didn't have power steering. And so it was a laborious thing to maneuver these cars and get them in. And they would, on occasion, get all the deckhands together and bounce the car up and down, and move the stern over a little bit and bounce it some more, move it over a little bit so it could finally fit in the place. It wasn't easy to get vehicles on and off those vessels. Whether in fact that was a, a, a limiting factor as far as the number of cars here on this island or on the island of Nantucket, uh, I, I don't think it was a substantial effect. To tell you why, a double-ended ferry that was roll on, roll off, where the cars could drive on and trucks could drive on, was introduced here on Martha's Vineyard uh, in the late 1940s and then the Islander was built in 1950. Nantucket did not have roll-on, roll-off until early 1970s. But you don't find a dramatic difference between the two islands, uh, e even though the mode of transportation was different uh, over the period. But the demand for double-ended ferries became too much. In 1972, a new ship was built to service Nantucket with roll-on, roll-off capabilities. And just to add to the confusion, it was called Nantucket. The old Nantucket was renamed Nashon. And as for the old, old Nantucket, the Nopska, it's time it come to an end. Every year they'd say they probably were gonna take it out, you know, I mean, for the past three years previous. And then they kept running it. But once the new Nantucket was built and running, uh, they really didn't need it. And you could unload and load in less than half the time than it took for the Nopska. Plus, it carried a lot more cars. Ironically, the Nopska, which was originally designed to accommodate the automobile, could no longer service the need of car owners. In September of 1973, it made its final run. It was kind of emotional because everybody knew it was the last uh, run that they were going to make. So uh, when we when we finished up in the last in Nantucket, we uh, headed back to Vineyard Haven that evening, and I, uh, I told everybody, well, this is it. But when the oiler used to go in a fire room to shut the main steam stops, I said, wait a minute, I'm going to do it. After it was taken out of service, the Nobska spent a couple of years as a restaurant in Baltimore. It was then sold to a new owner, who stripped it to eventually refurbish it into a new restaurant. But it never happened, and the ship sat unused in Baltimore for several years. During these years, a group of loyal followers formed to call themselves Friends of Nobska. They eventually would purchase the ship in 1988. The vessel would spend the next few years tied up in Providence, New Bedford, and Fall River while the Friends of Nopska worked to have it restored. The group soon changed their name to the New England Steamship Foundation, and in 1996, the Nopska made its way up to Boston for the start of the restoration. The engine was removed and sent to the vocational school in New Bedford.
The ship remains in dry dock, waiting for the completion of the hull. The hull is all up and in place, and we have about the probably about 5,000 feet of welding to do. The next phase is to seal up the hull uh, and also replace the, some of the framing that we had to take out and uh, that's all got to be welded in place and uh, after that we can launch her. The work has stopped while the foundation works to raise more funds. The Nopska, the last coastal steamboat in the U.S., still awaits the day when she can once again bring passengers to the islands of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket in the quiet elegance of yesteryear. You know, we Americans love the new, the latest. We greet each other and say, what's new? We don't say, what's old? Uh, we don't turn over an old leaf. Uh, but we're, we're growing up, and we're beginning to understand that what is old, the, the tried and true, those uh, works of art and ingenuity and technology that were uh, points of high achievement in the past are worth saving. They're beautiful and they give atmosphere and connection to other times, uh, to the present, and we need that. Uh, we need to be reminded that uh, some things are absolutely worth saving. The old Nantucket is, yes, we're sorry to see the boat go. We're sorry that it's sitting up there half complete now, or not even that far. But we remember the romance of travel. At this point in history, the Nopska is the last quadruple cylinder steam expansion steamer in the United States of America. When she was built, there were thousands. So she is the last of her breed. And uh, if she isn't operating, all we will have is pictures. It's important that we don't lose our history. Uh, we can't forget about it. I don't think any country should. Um, and American steamboats, coastal steamboats particularly, are very important in the development of the country. Uh, most of the railroad lines at New England, the original railroads, were built as feeder lines to the steamboats. And the Nobska specifically, because she is the last, and because she could uh, give future generations the experience of riding a steamboat, what it's like to ride a steamboat, uh, the aesthetic appeal of it, the tall flagpoles and flags snapping in the wind, the, the tall stack, the chime whistle, uh, the lack of vibration, the comfort, carpeting, uh, writing room, all the things that just you just don't see anymore. And I think it's really important to, to retain or restore uh, one little bit of this whole era so that future generations can experience and really know what it was like. And it's also, it's very pleasant. It's a very nice way to travel. Some things we save because they're so extraordinarily beautiful and unique. There are other things that are icons, that by looking at them, they remind us of things. And that's the Nobska. You look at the Nobska, and the Nobska swims into your mind, full of images of what it was like in the past. It's an extraordinary teaching device. It gives people the opportunity to be on the vessel and experience the way it was to sail back in the 1920s, like their parents and their grandparents' time. And uh, I, think, I think that's a worthwhile experience for all of us to realize what your family came through, you know, generations before. It is clearly indicative of a different day and time. A journey back in time can be done on the Nobska. I don't think anyone ever said, we want to get rid of the Nobska. You know, the, uh, the fact that it was maybe part of history didn't even enter into it. It was what we had for transportation, and that was great, cut us there. What more do you need? We're saving historic buildings all over America as we never did before, which is wonderful, which is it should be. We're not uh, looking as, at, at everything that is uh, a little out of date as a throwaway item as we used to. And there's no reason in the world why we can't uh, and shouldn't apply that same attitude towards some of the structures that we've used to travel the waters. The idea, for example, that 
that uh, the Vineyard Sound was once filled with all kinds of sailboats, steamboats, ships of every shape and kind, all of which are gone. Gone forever. Uh, what a shame. At this point here in the United States, we have four historic steamboats that are still active. But the Nopska is the last one that actually runs on the ocean. And she also has these classic lines and appearances that go back to those earlier steamers that were really a backbone to the commercial energy of New England. It's the last of its kind. Think of that, the last coastal steamer still in existence. And do we just say, oh, to hell with it?